Well, good evening. Good evening once again. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Discovering Revelation. We're at the end of a busy week. I know you're probably glad it's over. It's it's one of those those days that if you're superstitious, you won't you don't you want it to pass right away, but but God is stronger and he's in control. And so we don't worry about any of those things. As we look forward to the presentation this evening, I invite you once again to prepare your hearts and minds to receive the truth that God will be pouring out through Pastor Vic. So let's ask his blessing upon our meeting this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this privilege of being here to Listen to Pastor Vic break your truth to us. While we don't know everything, we thank you for the truth that has been revealed. And we ask that you continue to lead us into all truth and ultimately into the person who is truth. May his name be glorified. For we believe in Jesus, your son, who died and rose again that we might have hope and the promise of eternal life, regardless of what may happen in this life. And so as we go through this meeting today, we ask you once again to pour out your spirit through Pastor Vic, that your name may be glorified, and that your children may be edified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Testing, testing, there we go. So good evening. It's nice to have you again tonight. And hope you had a, a blessed day today. And I do enjoy these times of the year. And with all that is growing, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the blessing of the, this time of year, the grass keeps growing and growing. I guess that's a blessing. I gotta keep cutting it, right? So it seems like you just cut it and you have to cut it again, right? But today, the last few days actually, I've been uh, studying a lot and putting together the presentations for this weekend. So I want you to know I'm a lifelong learner too. You know, we're all learning, we're all growing and trying to understand God's word and we're guided by the Holy Spirit. That's what we want. And so I hope that you have been blessed and I think that these uh, presentations for the weekend are going to be a real blessing. And so I want to do a quiz before we go any further tonight, just to cover what we, uh, or review what we covered the other night. And so there's actually, I put six questions on the screen, so I added an extra one just to, uh, for discussion purposes. So I think some of these are going to be really easy. Uh, Number one, the second coming of Christ will be visible, personal, and accompanied by a lot of noise, true or false? True, right? We covered that. We saw the many texts. It's one of the most noisiest events, right? The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ will rise. We talked about how Jesus will come with the power and the glory of all the angels. He comes in his own glory. So it's something that's going to be very visible. The Bible says in Revelation 1-7, every eye will see him when he comes. And so if someone calls you up and says, hey, I see Jesus in my neighborhood, And you don't see him coming in the clouds. You know that can't be Jesus, right? And so that is something that is important to know um, when we talk about the second coming of Christ. Now, the reason why it's important to know his coming, how he's coming, because the Bible indicates Satan's going to try to deceive people on their understanding of his return. And that kind of leads to my next question. Jesus said it was okay to go and check out those who claim to be Christ to see if they are genuine. And what was his warning? He says, if they claim they're out in the desert or out in the 
uh, wilderness, do not go out and see them. Why? Because they will, uh, Satan will be working through that to deceive even the very elect. And so it's, it's something that when we think about it, um, several, the devil is pretty good at trying to trick us, isn't he? And what's helpful to know, when Jesus comes back, remember, we're caught up to meet him in the air, right? That will protect you most of all. I mean, he's not landing on the earth when he comes where we're caught up to meet him in the sky. That's how you'll know. When he comes with all the angels, he comes with his uh, glory, we're caught up. That's what the word rapture means. It's a Latin word. It means to be caught up. And it's a visible, literal uh, audible event. So don't go out. If someone claims to be in the wilderness, don't go out and see them because, you know, our senses can be deceived. And so number three, when Christ returns, it will be secret and silent. True or false? False, right? Uh, it's going to be a visible, like we said, nothing secret, nothing silent about it. I mean, think about it. Um, if he comes with all the angels, he's coming to come back for us, right? It's going to be the most glorious event that could happen. And he doesn't want it to be secret. I mean, he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords, right? He came in a very lowly way the first time when he came as a babe in a manger. But when he comes back the second time, he's coming back as, as king. And so the answer to that is false. Okay, number four. If one wasn't ready at the second coming of Christ, then he or she will have a second chance during a period of seven years that follows. Okay, so if you were here, you know that was false. Uh, but it is a popular teaching out there that uh, exists in books and movies. And that's why we looked at the Bible on this topic. Uh, that's what I believe the devil wants you to know or, or to believe. Because if he can get you to keep delaying your decision, delaying your decision, delaying your decision, he's happy. And so we think, well, if I didn't make it the first time, I'll get another chance. Well, that's what he wants you to do. Because when Jesus comes, remember, it's a decisive event. You know, either you're going to be saved or you're going to be lost. Either you're going to be ready or you're not going to be ready. And so when he comes, it's too late. I mean, you have to make your decision by then. Just as in the days of Noah, right, when the flood came and when the rain came down, if you weren't inside the boat, did you have another chance? It was too late, right? And remember, Jesus said, just as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man uh, be. Okay? So number five, we do not know when the second coming will occur, but we can know when it is near. True or false? That's true, isn't it? Um, we don't know the day or the hour. Sometimes we wish we knew the day or the hour, but I don't think that's a real blessing to know that because we are, I mentioned that earlier, we're good procrastinators. We push off our decisions. So we need to be ready every day, amen? Because we really don't know what can happen to us. So, you know, we need to be ready tonight, Amen? Because you never know what could happen on the way home. And so, but we do have the signs. And when we see the signs, Jesus says, know that my coming is near, even at the very doors. Okay, and the last question, this is number six. This is a bonus question, all right? In Paul's writings, he says that the Antichrist will rise first before the return of Christ. That's true, isn't it? Remember, we went through, Paul talks about that. The man of sin will appear first before the coming of the day of the Lord. And he will come in the temple and would um, declare himself um, having the uh, prerogatives of God. You find that in Paul's writings in Thessalonians. And so he made it very clear. The Antichrist comes first, and then we have the day of the Lord come. Now, what's popular out there is just the reverse, that you have this secret disappearance and then you have the rise of the Antichrist. And that's not biblically based. So be careful. Um, the Antichrist power is one power that works against Christ and his ministry. And we talked about that little horn power. Remember that little horn that would work against God and speak blasphemies and would rule for 1260 years and it would think to change God's law? Um, that power um, has already arisen. We've identified that. So the Antichrist uh, power has already been here. And we'll continue, by the way, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow night more when we talk about the mark of the beast. So you don't want to miss uh, tomorrow night's presentation. All right, so we are pressing ahead in our schedule. And it's hard to believe how fast this is going. Before you know it, this weekend will be over. And then we have next Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we have 
our last one next Saturday morning. And so we're going to be hitting a lot more important topics. I'm glad that several of you, as I've asked, you've been doing the lessons. So praise God. I hope that's helpful as you wrestle with these different subjects. And also, I was happy to see that several of you received the Bible. And wasn't it nice to be all wrapped? And and the ladies put the name, your name on there too. That was really nice. So they did a good job handing that out. So if you haven't gotten it yet and you're close, know that your Bible is coming very, very soon. So uh, 10 nights, 10 lectures, I should say, not 10 nights. But it's the New King James Bible. All right, so what's coming? What are we going to be covering? Well, don't miss this. I'm excited. I've been working on this for the last, you know, last couple of days uh, on the subject of the millennium. So the presentation in the morning will start tying in some of the sequence of things. I know some, we talked about the second coming. We're going to talk about the subject of death tonight. And so you'll see tomorrow morning, it will help more crystallize what the Bible is saying on the sequence of events. And so you don't want to miss tomorrow morning's presentation. Uh, Like I mentioned, this church meets on Sabbath morning, and uh, they have services tomorrow at 11. So Pastor Ramon has graciously allowed me to uh, do this presentation in the morning. Um, We're going to look at what's going to happen before the 1,000 years, during the 1,000 years, after the 1,000 years. And I think one of you was asking, are we going to talk about heaven? What are we going to do in heaven? We're going to talk about that tomorrow morning as well. So it's a hopeful message. It's filled with a lot of, um, really a lot of hope in what is is to come. So you don't want to miss that. And then we come back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and we're talking about the United States and prophecy and the mark of the beast. Now let me ask you, do you think that our country would be mentioned somewhere in Bible prophecy, the most powerful nation on earth in the last days? Well, we're going to see tomorrow night how the United States is mentioned in prophecy, and you don't want to miss that. We're going to talk about the mark of the beast as well, and several things will start coming together. As I mentioned, there's two beasts in Revelation. Did you know that? There is a beast that comes out of the sea and a beast that comes out of the earth. So you don't uh, want to miss it when we cover those uh, two topics, look at those two beasts, and that's tomorrow night. And then we come back on Sunday night, and we're going to talk about the subject of hell. Um, You know, there's a lot of misunderstandings on this topic. And so you don't want to miss this presentation. And we're going to look at how God uh, makes the best out of a bad situation. And so the subtitle is God's Strange Act. And what's interesting, because how things have been confusing for people, this is one topic that has led a lot of people to be angry towards God. They don't understand God's character. And so we're going to see how that's all related uh, on at this, when we look at this topic on the subject, the hot topic of hell. So we have a lot of different presentations still to come. And I think we're going to look at the four horsemen next week. We're going to look at the two women of Revelation next week, the Babylon and the bride. And those are important in the book of Revelation. So Pastor Ramon, I think we have our drawing for tonight. I think if everybody, you come every night, eventually you're going to get one of these prizes, right? Hopefully, the, the, the odds of it, right? We're now in our 11th night. And judging by the number of guests we have here, most of you should have received a gift by now. But hopefully, another one of you will get it tonight. The person receiving the gift tonight is number 232. There you go. Of course, if you give me five dollars, we'll make sure that you might win that prize, right? I'm just joking. So, or we'll pay Pastor Ramon. So, all right, all right. So our topic tonight: uh, Revelation's last trumpet. And we want the Holy Spirit to guide us once more as we open God's Word. And so let us uh, invite Him to be our teacher tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for getting us through another busy week. 
And Lord, we thank you that we can come together to study your word. But Lord, we know that spiritual things are spiritually understood and we need to be guided by you. And so we want you to be the teacher, to be our guide, and we just want to come and allow you to help us to understand the scriptures better. Lord, this is a very sensitive topic and it's a hopeful topic, but I pray that you will guide us in our understanding and help us to leave here tonight filled with hope because we know that one day soon you're coming back. So thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned in the prayer tonight, we're moving into a very personal and sensitive subject. The subject of death has affected all of us. Most here tonight, if I had you raise your hand, which I won't, most of us here tonight have probably lost someone very close to us, whether it's a parent, a spouse, a child, a grandparent, a friend. I've done many, many funerals over the years, and I've been with many families during their time of loss. I've been in the hospital room when people have taken their last breath. There are many feelings and memories which surround the topic of death and dying. And to make matters worse, there's a lot of confusion on this subject. Where do people go when they die? Is it a direct route to heaven or hell? Is there a limbo state or some state called purgatory? What about reincarnation? Is that real? Of course, people have their own anecdotal stories regarding death. So where does the truth lie? Well, tonight we're going to look at what the Bible actually says on this topic about death and the afterlife. We're not going to look at a Hallmark movie. We're not going to look at popular mythology. We're not going to just look at books, but we're going to look at some biblical texts in their proper context to see what the Bible teaches on this topic. So let's start tonight with the oldest book in the Bible. And you may not know this, but the oldest book actually uh, is the book of Job. Uh, We often think it's uh, Genesis, but it's actually Job. And notice here in chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Wisdom is with aged men and with length of days understanding. So our world today idolizes youth. We make young people the center of attention. We celebrate the up-and-coming pop stars and athletes and television celebrities. It seems like those are the ones that are being followed on social media and other places. But the Bible upholds older people. Scripture says the aged have a distinct advantage. It says wisdom and experience come with age. It's a principle we used to value. Grandparents were held in high esteem in most families, but not so much so today, which is a shame because if we listen to those who have experience, we could save ourselves a lot of uh, bad things, right? We could spare ourselves of a lot of grief. If you're preparing for college, it pays to ask someone who's been there. You can say, what can I expect from college? What would you wish that I would know before I start school? And maybe they could share a few things. It also works for those who plan to get married. What's marriage like? What do you wish you'd known before you got married? I mean, it would be wise to listen to those who've gone on before in their journeys. It works for your career. It works for retirement. It works for everything in life except death. When it comes to death and dying, who are you going to ask? You can't go to the graveyard for answers. If you did get an answer, you probably wouldn't stick around, right? So where do you go for answers about death and dying? Well, I'd like to suggest that we go to one that we've been focusing on throughout this series on Revelation. He's he's the main focus in the book of Revelation. This is Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So Jesus understands the subject of death better than anyone else. Can you say amen? He was in the grave. He came through the grave. 
and he's alive now to tell us about it. So tonight, let's see what Jesus says, shall we? First and foremost, Jesus understands how painful death is for those who have lost loved ones. This is the shortest verse in the Bible, John chapter 11, verse 35, just two words. And let's say it together. Jesus what? Jesus wept. Now, why was the Savior crying? He, his friend Lazarus died, and the family members were grief-stricken. Jesus wept in sympathy. He understood their sense of loss. He was experiencing it. Lazarus was his friend. But he also had a unique understanding that death was never part of God's plan. You see, friends, we were made to live forever. God never wanted us to die. So Jesus wept over his ruined creation. No one feels the sting of death more keenly than our Savior and Lord. Because of his unique perspective, Jesus' opinion on death is the one I'm interested in tonight. How about you? Now, the best place to start about when you look at death and figuring it out is to see how life was supposed to work in the beginning. And so we want to go back to the book of Genesis. This is Genesis 2 and verse 7. Notice what the Bible says. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became, notice, a living soul. So here's the formula for life. It's the dust of the ground plus the breath of life. That combination together makes up a living soul or a living being. Any biologist will tell you you're related to the dirt in your yard and the soot in your fireplace. But God did something special with the elements of the earth. I, I love this picture. He took the dust and he, of the ground and he sculpted a complex, fine-tuned human body. And then he knelt in a very intimate way and breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. The heart began to beat. The lungs began to expand. Man became a living soul, a living animate being. Human beings were designed to live forever. That's what God wanted for Adam and Eve and all that followed. But the wages of sin is what? Is death. So through death, through, through sin, I'm sorry, we added death to the equation. And so now we look at Genesis 3.19. For dust you are, and to dust you what? You shall return. So notice what happens when we die. According to God, we go where? We go back to the dust. We go back to the earth. Once a little boy came running into the kitchen with an urgent question for his mom. He said, mommy, mommy, the preacher said in church this week that when we die, we go back to the dust. Is that really true? Yes, honey, it is. Why do you want to know? Because I lost one of my Legos under the couch, and when I crawled under there, it looks like somebody's coming and going because there's a whole lot of dust underneath. Here's another verse on the subject, Ecclesiastes 12.7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So in death, the formula of life is simply reversed. The body goes back to the ground, and the spirit, which is the breath of life, returns back to God who first gave it. To confirm that the spirit returning to God is the breath of life, notice this verse in Job 27 and verse three. All the while, my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. So notice as you read that passage, um, the writer there, Job, is using Hebrew poetry and Hebrew poetry rhymes ideas rather than words. So you have the same idea expressed in two different ways. You first have the phrase, breath is in me, and then he repeats the idea by saying the spirit of God is in my nostrils. 
Now, what's interesting, notice the word breath and spirit are in the same verse, same idea. And in fact, it's the same Hebrew word that's used for both. The word is ruach. And it's translated in English as either spirit or breath. And they're used interchangeably by the writers. The word means air or wind. And so look how other translations put it. I have the New King James, which that's the gift Bible that we've been giving out. This is Job 27 verse 3 again, but from the New King James Version. Notice it says, as long as my breath is in me, that's the word ruach, and the breath is the breath of God is in my nostrils. So the word breath, the ruach, is translated first as breath, but the same word is now, instead of spirit, it is breath again. So the word is used interchangeably. Breath, spirit, it comes from the Hebrew word ruach, has the same idea. And it means the breath of life that keeps us alive. And you know that it means breath because it says here, Job didn't have a spirit being in his nostrils. It was the breath of life. And so look at this passage. This is Psalm 146, verses three and four. Notice it expands on the idea. It says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His what? His breath goes forth. He returneth to his earth. And what does that say? In that very day, what? His thoughts, what? Perish. Very interesting. So at death, we see that the breath, that spark which comes from God, which keeps us alive, that goes back to God. But notice it says that when you die, your thoughts, what? Your thoughts perish. Some versions say his plans perish. Your thoughts and plans are a function of your brain, right? And when you die, your brain doesn't work anymore, so you can't have thoughts, you can't make any plans. You quit thinking the moment you die, which raises an important question. I heard for many years, people say that when you you go into the presence of God, immediately at death. Now, if you're saved, you will go into God's presence at some point, but it doesn't happen right away as soon as you die? If so, don't you think you would have some thoughts? Of course you would, right? But the Bible says you have no thoughts when you die. So here's another question. If you suddenly found yourself in the presence of Jesus, don't you think that you would worship him? Of course you would, right? But listen to what the Bible says. This is the the next passage. Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead do not, what? Praise the Lord, nor anyone who goes down into, what? Silence. So follow me very carefully. God's word says the moment we die, we become silent. Now I know it's not what most people think, but it's the testimony of scripture over and over again. Notice this is Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6. The living know that they will die, but the dead, what? No, nothing. And they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share of anything done under the sun. So according to this passage, the dead have no thoughts or feelings or any involvement in what is happening here on earth. That's very interesting. This, I, this is how I know as you read that passage, this is how I know that the psychics aren't telling the truth. They can't talk to the dead. Scriptures say the dead have no share in what is happening here. So there's a very good reason God forbids us to go to the psychics, to the channelers, to the spiritual mediums who try to communicate with the the dead. He warns us against it. So notice this is Job 7 verses 9 and 10. It says, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. 
So notice here, when he says here that you shall not go and return to the house anymore, we see that the dead don't come back and speak and communicate to the living. The Bible says that's familiar spirits, and that's what he's warning us about. So what happens then when we die? Well, listen to the words of Jesus in John 11. I think this makes it very clear. Verses 11 and 12. His, Jesus received word that his friend Lazarus was sick. And notice what he said. This is verses 11 and 12. These things he said. And after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus, what? Sleeps. But I go that I might wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? So, Laz so he made it very clear. So here's the question. To what did Jesus compare death to? Based on what we just read. He compared it to what? He compared it to sleep. He used the word sleep to describe death. Do you know that the Bible likens death to sleep over 70 different times? Why is that? Because that's exactly what happens. When you die, you don't know anything. You're silent like when you're asleep. Now, how long do the dead sleep? Well, Jesus continues. This is verses 23 and 24. Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. That's good news, right? Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again when? In the resurrection, what? At the last day. So Martha understood that Lazarus was asleep until the resurrection on the last day. She agrees with the many verses that we've seen in our studies of scripture. She was looking forward to the day when he would wake up. And Paul, when you read the book, uh, his writings in the New Testament, he talks about this as well. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, talking about the second coming of Christ. He says, for this we say to you, by the word of the Lord. Now, by the way, he's writing to those who've lost loved ones. If you read there in Thessalonians, he's writing to those who are grieving, those who have experienced loss. And this is what he said, for this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are what? Asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, which are the sleeping saints, will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. When are we with the Lord? at the second coming and the resurrection. That's what Paul is pointing us to. Now notice how he concludes these verses. He says, therefore, comfort one another with what? With these words. What did Paul say? We need to comfort one another with the words about what? The second coming and the resurrection. Friends, that's what the Bible teaches and that's what all the early Christians understood that they are pointing to the time when Jesus will come back and the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. If you go and visit the catacombs in Rome, the pagan graves have sad and hopeless inscriptions on them. They say goodbye forever. But the Christian graves are different. They say good night until the darkness passes. We'll see you again in the morning. The Christians had hope in the future resurrection. Now the pagans believed, if you study this out, the pagans believed in the immortal soul. That soul that keeps living after death. The Christians put their hope in the resurrection without which they did not believe that they would have any existence. Early Christians didn't believe in an disembodied souls with this inherent immortality. And that's why the doctrine of the resurrection was so important for the Christian. Now, someone will say, well, doesn't the Bible talk about an immortal soul? Actually, it's not there. Do you know that 
The word soul is used 1,600 times, but never do you find the adjective immortal in front of the word soul. So the mortal soul is not there, but who does have immortality? We find this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, speaking of the creator God. Notice it says, who alone, talking about God, who alone has what? Immortality. Dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. So only one being is immortal by nature, and that's the eternal God, not mortal man. We are all born with an expiration date unless we live to see Christ coming. Now let's look at another, let's go back and look at Genesis 2 again before we go any further. This is Genesis 2 and verse 7. It said, And the Lord God, this is how man was created, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So when you have the combination of the body and they breathe into the nostrils the breath of life, when those two things come together, it says man became what? A living soul. Did you notice something? The Bible doesn't say you have a soul. The Bible says you are a soul a living being, a living person. With that understanding, the question is, can a soul then die? And the answer is yes. Notice the Bible says in Ezekiel 18, verse four, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall what? Shall die. Remember, the wages of sin is death. When you die, you fall asleep. You simply rest until Jesus comes. The book of Job lays out the process of death and afterlife in no uncertain terms. Notice this is Job 14, 12 through 14. So man lies down and does not rise, talking about death, till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Oh, that they would hide me in the grave, Job says, that you would would conceal me until your wrath is past that you would appoint me at a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. So let's analyze what Job just said. So first, he says, we sleep until the heavens are no more. So when we die, we sleep. Secondly, we are resurrected when the wrath of God is past. And then thirdly, we wait until our change comes. So do we know exactly when and how this all happens? Well, yes, the Bible makes it very clear. This is Revelation 6, verse 14, as to when, this answers as to when the heavens are no more. This is Revelation 6. It says, then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. We talked about that on Wednesday night. But notice, this is Peter's writing, 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord, talking about the coming of Christ, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. So when do the heavens pass away? When they are no more. And that happens on the day of the Lord when Jesus comes again. Now for for Job's second point, when will God's wrath be passed? This is Revelation 15, one. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels have the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. This is also connected to the second coming of Christ. Jesus comes after the seven plagues have fallen um, before he returns. Now for the Job's last point, notice about waiting to be changed. Job said, we rest in the grave until our change comes. So when does that happen? So notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. I love this passage. It's so clear. Verses 51 through 55. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all what? We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be what? Changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. 
So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? So friends, there's no mistaking what Paul is saying. We are changed when? At the last trumpet, right? When Jesus comes. When the trumpet is blasted, what does it do? It wakes up those who are asleep in the grave. The dead come out of the grave with real physical bodies, flesh and blood human beings. They're resurrected. In fact, Paul says this in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we are also eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So Paul says our new bodies, when we come forth from the grave, will be like whose body? Like Jesus' body, his glorified resurrected body, right? You know, Jesus, remember when he was resurrected, he wasn't just a ghost, but he had a physical body, right? He said, you can touch my side. And he ate food. So he had a physical body, but it was a glorified body. When he, and that's the kind of body that we'll receive when we come forth from the grave. Now think with me, we were originally created, now follow this, we were originally created with real bodies and we were never supposed to die. Then and we see that we come out of the grave with real bodies that we will never die. We'll have immortality. So why would we ever exist as a disembodied spirit or ghost in between? According to the Bible, human beings don't have an existence apart from a physical body. When you study it out, you find that's really Greek thinking. It came from Greek philosophy. You probably have heard of Plato. He's the one that made the immortality of the soul very popular in those early years of the church. But it didn't come from the apostle Paul. Notice this is um, J.A. Beeth from his book, Immortality of the Soul, talking about how the, the church picked up the Greek philosophy, particularly Plato, and this immortality of the soul. He says, the phrase, the soul immortal, so frequent and conspicuous in the writings of Plato, we have not found in the pre-Christian literature outside the influence of Greek philosophy, nor have we found it in Christian literature until the latter part of the second century. We have noticed that all the earliest Christian writers who used this phrase were familiar with the teaching of Plato. So all those early church leaders followed the writings of Plato Plato and Greek philosophy. And one of them that was very popular writers was Tertullian. It says one of these, Tertullian expressly refers both the phrase and doctrine to him. We have failed to find any trace of this doctrine of the immortality of the soul in the Bible. It is put altogether alien, both in phrase and thought, to the teaching of Christ and his apostles. I think it's very interesting. Where did the idea of this immortality of the soul come from? It came from Greek philosophy. This is Tertullian. Um, He lived 160 to 220 AD. He says, I use the opinion of Plato. So he got his ideas from Plato when he declares every soul is immortal. So notice what Jesus said. Going back to John chapter 14, verses one through three, he gives this promise He says he's going to die on the cross, he's going to go to heaven, and he's going to prepare a place for us, okay? And notice, he says, I'm going to come back. Notice what he says here. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, and what does he say? I will what? Come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He doesn't say, I'm coming again, so where I am, there there your body may be also. He's saying, I'm coming back for you. When you are coming forth at the resurrection, he says, I'm coming back to take you to be with me in heaven. So this is Job 14, verses 12 through 14. So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. 
They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath has passed, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. If you die and go to heaven right away, these verses should all say my body, not me, because if you're already there, then what is the purpose of coming back? He should have said uh, my body instead of not me or I. In addition to that, dying and going to heaven presents a, a major problem. It creates a strange scenario where departed ones can see everything that you're doing. Someone said, what, what if I die and marry someone, uh, I should say it this way, what if I die and my, my, my wife marries someone better looking than me? What would happen if they had more money than I have? Wouldn't be pretty happy at all. Someone else would say, what if the new spouse starts abusing the kids in the home? And they're watching from down and watching all that take place. How can you enjoy heaven in those scenarios? See, friends, God spares us from those things. Mercifully, he says, let them sleep through whatever may come. And one day, they will come forth, they will wake up and come forth from the grave at the second coming in the resurrection. Now, what I'm sharing is not unique. Many great theologians have understood this important truth. Uh, you probably know Martin Luther. He started the Lutheran Church, one of the great reformers. This is what Martin Luther said. Scripture everywhere affords such consolation, which speaks of the death of the saints as if they fell asleep and were gathered to their fathers and awaited the resurrection together with the saints who preceded them in death. So they say we'll all be sleeping. Thus after death, the soul goes into the bedchamber and to its peace, and while sleeping, it does not realize its sleep. So Luther was absolutely right. He says when you go to sleep at night, you don't realize how long you've slept until morning time, right? Have you ever noticed when you set your alarm clock, you've put your, you fall asleep on the bed, and before you know it, you, you fell asleep and you wake up and your alarm's going off and it seems like you just slept for like five minutes, right? But it turned out that you slept for eight hours. You just, you, you lose that ability to really understand how time goes by. And that's what sleep was like and that's what happens at death. You close your eyes and time can go by and you don't even realize it. And then you wake up and you see uh, Jesus at the second coming. So he goes on, he says, we shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up. Then I shall rise in a moment and be happy with him forever. So in the end, it'll be like dying and going to heaven for the saved. But you close your eyes, you go to sleep. A hundred years could go by, 300 years could go by, and it'll just seem almost like it's instant, like when you go to sleep at night. But when you close your eyes, all those years could go by, and boom, boom, just like that. When Jesus comes in the clouds, it could just seem almost instantly. Because just like sleep, our next conscious thought will be Jesus coming, and he takes us to be with him in heaven at the second coming. Notice here, why, why do we wait until the second coming? Well, for one thing, there must be a judgment first. This is Revelation 22 and verse 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So all decisions must be made and then notice the next verse, what it says, and behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. So everyone, what Jesus is saying, everyone gets rewarded at the same time when he comes back at the second coming. With a few exceptions noted in the Bible, 
Old Testament believers don't spend more time in heaven than New Testament believers. First, there's a judgment, and then everyone gets the reward of eternal life. So that's one reason. The second reason of waiting is that we need to understand the dead wait so that we won't be deceived by messages from beyond the grave. And friends, it's troubling to see spiritualism is on the rise in our day. And it will be the downfall of millions of people in the end. If someone thinks that the dead are alive, they're able to come back and communicate They're vulnerable to these familiar spirits and to deceptive lives. Now, I want to share this story that I read. It's about a mom. This is going back a few years. The mom had had a son who went off to the Vietnam War. And so she, that was her only son. And so she was very troubled that her son went off to fight. One day, she got a telegram from the army that said that her son had died. So she was devastated. You know, any parent would, you know, get that kind of note would be devastated. And so the mom was missing her son and grieving over him. And there was a neighbor down the street that was into spiritualism and seances. And so she invited, the neighbor invited the mom to come and join in the seance. And she said, no, I don't believe in that stuff. I'm a Christian, and I, I don't follow those things. But she was missing her son so much, she said, I'm going to go. And so she joined a group of people inside the living room. They gathered around. And as they were doing some chanting and some other things, suddenly off in the corner was someone that looked just like her son. Started sharing things with her in the room that only her and the, and the son knew. She said, wow, I'm able to see my son now. And so she started going back to the seance almost on a weekly basis. And so she began really kind of giving up reading the Bible. All that mattered was seeing her son every week. And he was describing what heaven is like and, you know, and all these things. And one evening, it's a true story, one evening, there was a lady. She was there at their house sitting in the, in the living room on the couch. And there was a knock on the door. And she said, who's here to see me this late hour? So she got off the seat of her couch and she went and opened the door and standing in the doorway was her son. And she said, son, why are you here? Our appointment is not until like next week. And he said, mom, what are you talking about? And it turned out that the son never died. It was a mistake from the army. The telegram that received was a mistake. And so she began to be greatly troubled. Who was it then that she was meeting on a weekly basis in that seance chamber? And friends, that's why we have this warning in the book of Revelation, Revelation 16, 14, for they are spirits of what? demons performing signs and wonders which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. You see, in the last days, evil spirits will be working miracles. And no greater miracle he can pull off than impersonating dead loved ones. I'll tell you, the devil hits us when we're most vulnerable. And he knows when we experience loss, we are vulnerable, we are hurting, we are grieving, And that's when he'll show up to do some of these deceptive uh, miracles. And every meeting that I've done, and I've done many of these through the years, I've always met somebody that will come up to me and they will say, Vic, my grandchild, now I'm using this as an example, there's kind of variations of this. My grandchild is seeing grandpa in the bedroom at night and talking, periods of bright light, kind of looks like grandpa talking to the grandson. And, you know, after hearing that the Bible says that we're asleep until the second coming, then we're not awake, and the spirits don't come back and talk to the living, they're asking, well, who is that dead great, who's that grandpa then coming and meeting with my grandson? 
And I will go back to this text. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. That's not grandpa. The Bible says that he is asleep. Right? Demons performing signs to deceive in the very end. Notice the warning. This is Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 12. There shall not be found among you a witch or a consulter with familiar spirits. And by the way, spiritualism, you watch shows today. They're doing medium, you know, they're doing channeling. They're talking spiritualism, talking to the dead. It's growing and growing, becoming more and more popular in our world, in our culture today. But notice the warning years ago, there shall not be found among you a witch or a consulter with familiar spirits or a necromancer. For all that these do, for all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. So what does God say? Don't try talking to dead, to the dead. You enter into the devil's playground when we do that. And he says, leave it alone. It's an abomination. So where did we get the idea that when we move on somewhere else when we die? Well, notice originally we find that it was the first lie that was told on earth by the father of all lies. You remember when Satan appeared as a serpent and he met Eve there at the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And he was telling her, eat of this fruit. And she said, well, she's saying, well, God told us we're not to eat of this fruit. And if we did, we would die. And then remember what the serpent said? He says, don't worry. If you eat of this fruit, you will surely not die. You remember that? See, the serpent said, don't worry about God's commands. In fact, sin is the path to your higher destiny. Eat of the fruit and you'll reach a higher level. Don't worry about death. You're immortal. You can sin and live. Well, we see in this topic, it's a question of what we're going to believe, God's truths or Satan's lies. Satan's lie is the basis of all spiritualism, friends. If the dead are alive, why not try to communicate with them? Why wouldn't God want us to benefit from their knowledge? But if, and I raise this, but if the dead are dead and they're asleep, then we've been set up by the great deceiver himself. But someone may be wondering, when we look at something like this, the verses in the Bible, notice it says, like Jesus' promise, what about the thief on the cross? Didn't he make a promise to the thief? You remember that in the Gospels? Let's go and look at that. This is Luke 23. This is 42 and 43. Then he said to Jesus, this is the thief. Remember, there are two thieves, one on the right, one on the left. You know, and by the way, you know who should have been in the center one uh, instead of Jesus? It should have been Barabbas, right? So Jesus was taking uh, Barabbas' place. He was obviously not a hardened criminal at all. But you know the story. Ponch, um, the Pilate condemned him uh, to be crucified. And so you have one on the right and one on the left. And here's one of the response of one of them. The one was mocking the other one became a believer. But notice it says here, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, as surely I say to you, comma, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now it looks like Jesus promised the thief that he would be in heaven that very day. But the question is, is that really what he said? So there's some problems here. Number one, Jesus didn't set up his kingdom that day. You find that. That's not the case. Jesus didn't go to heaven that day either. And why do I say that? Notice what we find in John 20, verse 17. This is after his resurrection. Jesus said to Mary, to her, do not cling to me. And what did he say? This is after his resurrection. He says, so it's after him dying on the cross, he's been raised. He says, do not cling to me for I have not yet, what? ascended to my father. So Jesus didn't go to heaven that day. The thief didn't go to heaven that day because Jesus didn't, haven't gone to heaven that day. And so this is Luke 23, 42 and 43 again. Notice, and I have it circled here, the comma. Now, you know, in the Greek language, the punctuation, I mean, in the Bibles that we have, the punctuation was added later. In the original Hebrew and the Greek, there's no punctuation. Okay, and you find that, um, you know, the translators were thankful that translators put periods and apostrophes and 
quotes and put sentences and paragraphs together. We're thankful for that. It makes it easier to read, right? But the original language doesn't have punctuation. I bring this up to look at this verse and how a comma could be misleading because that was added to the text by the translators. And so it says in verses 42 and 43, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. So it almost sounds like that very day you'll be with me in paradise. Now, what if we simply put the comma and after um, that, after the word today, just move it after instead of before, and it says, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. You see the difference? So in the previous one, it makes it sound as though today they would be in paradise. But here he's saying, I'm telling you today, this hour, that someday in the future, you'll be with me in paradise. And I believe that's what the text is saying there. Now I want to just emphasize the importance of punctuation. It's kind of a funny little way of looking at it. Um, let's eat, comma, grandma. So that sounds like an invitation to dinner, right? But let's remove the, the comma. Let's eat grandma, right? So that's a big difference, right? It sounds like grandma's on the menu. So that's why you have to understand, um, when you look at the other text, Jesus um, didn't go to paradise that day. He didn't even send till later. And so he was just making the promise that day to the thief that one day soon, one day in the future, you will be with me. You will have eternal life. That's what he's talking about there. So what about the text? One other text, and then we'll wrap it up tonight. The other text, you know, because this often comes up when, it come, when people talk about death. What about the text that says, absent from the body, present with the Lord? You know, that might be something that's coming to your mind right now. In light of all the other texts that we looked at, these are the two that often come up. And say, so what is that then? How does that relate to the others? Well, this is 2 Corinthians 5. Paul's writing, verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Does this verse prove everything that we've looked at thus far, does it prove it wrong? And I would say tonight, not at all. You know, when you do hermeneutics, you want to take all the texts that are clear and try to understand the verse that's a little unclear. You want to take all the majority texts on a topic and then have it relate to a minority text and see and try to understand what that uh, isolated passage is talking about. Does this verse say anything about when you're absent from the body or present with the Lord? So let us dig into this. Somehow this verse must agree with all the other verses that we have been reading, including verses by the Apostle Paul who wrote this passage. So let's go to this passage. When did Paul expect to be present with the Lord? Well, he writes this. You're familiar with this passage. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth, he's writing. Now, Paul is, by the way, if you read this in Timothy, he's about to die. Okay? He, he knows that his time is coming to an end. And he's talking about the promise of the future. So he writes to young Timothy, and he says this in chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, notice it says, shall give me at that day. And what day is he talking about? He's talking about in the future, the second coming, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but to all of them that also what? Love his appearing. So he was looking forward to the day when he would receive his crown, when the dead in Christ will rise. And we will receive new bodies and receive eternal life, immortality. That's what he was looking forward to, that crown, that reward. So Paul expected his reward when Jesus comes like everyone else. So why does he say absent from the body, present with the Lord? The key is understanding that there are two bodies. There's the earthly and there's the heavenly. There's the mortal and the immortal. That's what he's simply contrasting here. This is 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house, so this is our mortal body in the blue, this tent, that's our earthly body, is destroyed. 
we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So that's our immortal bodies. Um, so we have an earthly body, which will be destroyed, and we have a heavenly body that will be eternal. That's our future reward. And then he continues on. He says, for in this we groan, and we groan, don't we? We, we long to get new bodies someday, don't we? You know, I, I heard this um, funny uh, comment, just to point this out. You know, we know that you're getting older. When you're down there tying your shoe and you stay down there and you ask, what else can I do while I'm down here? So our bodies are getting old, aren't they? We're groaning. We're longing for Jesus to come. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. So we want to get our heavenly immortal bodies, don't we? We don't want to be naked, that is, without a body, do we? So what is Paul saying? Continue on. For we in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. What is Paul saying? It's a burden living in this body, but it's better than no body at all. So we'll stay in it in hope of getting our new immortal bodies, which will not be a burden at all. And we'll receive them when Jesus comes. And when the mortal will become immortal. And when the corruptible will become incorruptible at the last trumpet. So 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So the Holy Spirit is a guarantee that we'll have a new body one day when Jesus comes. And then he says here, so we are always confident knowing that while we're at the home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. Friends, Jesus is in heaven and we are here in our earthly mortal bodies. We're absent now from the presence of the Lord, but what the Bible's saying, one day we will be present with him and we will have our new bodies and be with him. And we long for that day to happen, don't we? We long to receive those uh, new bodies. We long for Jesus to come. We are confident, he says, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I long to be with Jesus when he comes. But we are groaning now and waiting for that day to happen so that we can be present with the Lord in our immortal bodies. So Paul isn't saying anything that contradicts the 39 other biblical writers when it talks about what happens at death. And here, Paul isn't saying anything that contradicts his own writings. The Bible is consistent. I think Satan has tried to confuse this issue. He says the penalty of sin is not really death. But we see, friends, the cross speaks otherwise. The penalty of sin is death because Jesus had to die for our sins. Death is our enemy. It's not our friend. It was never part of God's plan. And the only way out of it is the resurrection and having faith and trust in Jesus Christ that no matter what happens to us in this life, we have the assurance of eternal life and having that reward when he comes to take his people home. So I want to go back to John 11. I'm going to close with a personal experience. This is going back to the story of uh, Lazarus uh, and Mary and Martha. Um, it says here in verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So where did Martha get that from? Directly from Jesus. She believed that her brother would be resurrected at the last day when Jesus comes the second time. But notice Jesus responded and he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And so you know this story as we read on because Jesus is going to give Mary and Martha and all of us an example of what will happen on resurrection morning. And so Lazarus has been asleep in the tomb now, and it's been four days. The body is decaying. 
I mean, that's, it's starting to go back to the dust, as the Bible says. The breath of life went back to God. So Lazarus is asleep. Notice verse 39. It says, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. But that didn't stop Jesus at all, did it? Because you read in the next verse, or as part of the verse, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And by the way, he didn't say come down. He said, come forth, right? And someone once said, if Jesus did not say Lazarus, but simply said, come forth, hundreds of graves would have burst open that day because he is the resurrection and the life. But you know, once he gave that command, that life suddenly came back into those lifeless limbs. Lazarus' heart began to beat again. His lungs began to expand. He came forth from the tomb, resurrected. And what we find is that Lazarus was an example of what's going to happen at the last day when the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will arise, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds and thus always be with the Lord. Now I say this, if I had been Lazarus and I had already been in heaven for four days, you know what I said to the Lord? Uh, Sorry, I'm not going back down. I'm going to stay here. But he doesn't say that, does he? Because he was asleep in the tomb. And by the way, when you read in the Gospels after that, Lazarus was not describing what heaven is like. There's no comment whatsoever of his experience, which means that he was asleep until he was woken up four days later through the resurrection and the life. The resurrection of Lazarus is the proof that Jesus will raise our believing loved ones too. It will be a miracle at the last day when the trumpet will sound. At the last day, there will be a resurrection. God has a record of our identity. He knows everything about us. He knows where you've been buried. We have nothing to be afraid of the grave. When we have faith in Jesus Christ, he is the resurrection of the life. And he, through his power, he will speak the word. When he comes back, he will say, come forth. And the dead in Christ will arise. So I want to close with this personal story. I don't know if you can recognize anybody in that picture. Um, That is me when I was like two years old, I think. And that's my dad. Um, My dad was, remember I told you I was an engineer before I became a pastor. And my dad was an engineer. He was actually an aeronautical engineer. We grew up in Ohio. Uh, He worked for Wright Pat Air Force Base. But sadly, when I was, uh, I'm sorry, I was one year old. So this is after my birth mom died of cancer. And she was only 38 years old when she died. And it was very hard on my family. My, you could see my siblings were uh, much older than I was. And it was a very, very difficult time in, in, in our life. My dad remarried. And she's, uh, she was a widow. He was a widow. And they came together. And she, uh, her name was Faith. She was my stepmom, which really, for me, she was my mom. I didn't know anything different. And I'm thankful she helped me. Uh, to understand Jesus and to appreciate his word. And I'm so grateful for what she had done in my life. And I was very, very close with my dad. Um, I spent a lot of time with him. He was my hero. He was my mentor. And when I uh, left high school, I went off to college. I told you I went to Georgia Tech. I was a student there following kind of his footsteps. And, And my last year of college, my last semester of college, I received word that my dad had cancer. And he had, my dad had been a smoker. He had smoked a pipe for many years. He had stopped for 10 years, but it, apparently it came and came back, or came, the cancer came even after all that time. And so he had a, a, a massive uh, tumor and it went to his brain. And so they did emergency surgery 
in the spring of 1989. And this is after his surgery. He miraculously lived after that surgery. It was the size of a goose egg. And so we were having, as a family, we were having this um, special party for him. And this is a picture of him. And um, you can see uh, he was getting radiation treatments at that time. Um, what I'm thankful for, as he was going through this experience, my dad had faith in God. I went through a conversion experience around the same time my dad did. And so when I would come home before this, coming home from college, we would share our experiences together, what the Lord did, and what he was doing in each of our lives, and what he was reading, and what I was reading. And I believe that God touched his heart um, before he had gotten cancer. And so he recovered from that surgery. So I went back to school, and it was um, my last semester, and my dad started getting more and more treatments, but apparently the cancer uh, began to spread. And it went to his um, bones and different things, and he went into the hospital. And I was able to uh, finish my classes and go spend time with him in the hospital. And so every day for like two weeks, my professors let me leave, and every day I was there with my dad, and he got worse and worse, and he started taking morphine. And it was a really tough time to see him suffer like that. And it was time for graduation, and my dad um, really wanted me to graduate. So he says, son, I can't go for your graduation, but I want you to go graduate. I'm really proud of you. I said, dad, I want to leave you here at the hospital. But he said, I want you to go. Please go to the hospital. I mean, go to, the, to graduation. So I did. And so I left him there at the hospital. Of course, my family was still there. And back in those days, you didn't have cell phones. You didn't have text messages. You just had those landlines. And it was by chance you would catch somebody. So I was staying with a friend, and I didn't leave the phone number with my family. I forgot. And so I graduated from college. My family wasn't able to be there. And I, strangely, that morning, I woke up really early the next morning, and I started heading back home. And I... Um, I don't know why I woke up that early. I don't usually wake up like four in the morning, but it was really early after graduation. So I started heading back home and I had my diploma in hand. And I said, I'm gonna go to the hospital. I'm gonna show my dad the diploma. So I pulled up in, into the parking lot. I had a little pickup truck at that time. I got out and I had my diploma and went into the hospital, went to the second floor. And once the elevator door opened, I turned the corner and I started going into his room. And when I, to my surprise, the room was empty. And I said, you know, maybe they moved my dad. And so I went to the nurse's station. And the nurse told me, she said, are you the son that we're trying to reach? And I said, yeah. I, I, did something happen? I'm looking for my dad. There's nobody in the room. Did you move him? And, I, and she said, I'm sorry, sir, to tell you that, that morning, earlier that morning, your father had died. And I have to tell you, I was devastated. You know, this was my hero. So when I went home, I was just crying and crying in my car. And that funeral service was very hard to, to go through. But I am so thankful that my dad believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that he accepted him by faith. And he is buried there in Kettering, Ohio. Um, this is this headstone. He's asleep. He doesn't know anything. And in that same burial area, this is the headstone of my mom. I was born, just so you know, I was born in 1967, and she died in 1968, so I was one year old. And in that same cemetery is my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunt and uncle. And then just a couple of years ago, my uh, stepmom, which was really my mom, she uh, passed away at 87. And she's buried in the same cemetery. And she was cremated. And so we had a special service for her. But I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes. When the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, 
and thus we shall always be with the Lord. God is trying to bring comfort to all of us who have lost loved ones. And there's a lot of confusion on this topic, but friends, I think the scriptures are very, very clear. When you just look at the text, that we're simply asleep until resurrection morning. And we have a wonderful hope that when Jesus comes, the sky will be filled with the power and glory of the angels, the trumpet will sound, and those who are sleeping in the grave will rise forth. And when they come forth, they won't have the body like my dad had when he died from cancer and seeing him lose weight as every day went by. When he comes forth, he's gonna have a perfect glorified body and I'm looking forward to that reunion day so trust him by faith if you've lost a loved one trust him by faith and to be ready ourselves for the coming of Jesus as well let's pray together heavenly father such a a truth that's filled with so much hope And Lord, I know there's a lot of confusion on this topic today. The devil wants us to think that we somehow can communicate with the dead, that when we die, we don't really die. But we see from Scripture that we have nothing to fear of the grave, that we're asleep, and we don't know anything until that bright and beautiful morning when you come, when the graves will burst open, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise. I pray that if we have lost a loved one, that we will hold on to that truth, Lord. It's a truth that gives us hope. Those through the years who have not that hope, then death can be a very serious thing, and a serious loss without any hope. But we know because of what you have done, you are the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in you Although he may die, he shall live again. So be with us as we go home. Help us to find comfort in your word and bring us back again in the morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We hope to see you in the morning. I put this on the screen. I have to show you this. I said, I'll see you in the morning. And that's not resurrection morning. I'm talking about tomorrow morning. (laughs) So... Uh, We have a special service here. Like I said, we're going to talk about the millennium. We're going to talk about, okay, we have the second coming, but what about the thousand years? We'll be looking at all that. We'll talk about heaven. So 11 o'clock, you know the place. It's very comfortable. Uh, God be with you and get a good night.